one. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly COVID-19 media briefing with uh, Montgomery County Executive Mark Elridge, Dr. Earl Stoddard, Director of the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, and our Health Officer, Dr. Travis Gales. I'm Lorna Vigeli, Hispanic Public Information Officer for Montgomery County Government. And uh, for the members of the media, you know the drill. Use the chat to ask permission to record and also later on during this presentation to ask your questions. And with that, Mr. County Executive. So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, God, I can't even remember which briefing this is in the long series of briefings, but uh, thank you for joining us again today. Um, to start by just going through some data points. Um, the county is at 55,531 total cases. And um, we have 328 new cases reported today. Our deaths have climbed to 1,212. Hospitalization rate is 80.3% and cases per 100,000 are 36.6. Uh, these numbers, particularly cases per 100,000, remain far too high. Um, and though they are coming down, they are not coming down you know, as fast as we'd like them to get down. Uh, last week, we began to pre-register people 75 and older for vaccine. Uh, so far, over 68,000 people have been pre-registered. We encourage people over 75 to please pre-register. We are trying to manage uh, people coming to the sites. So that people don't show up where there's no vaccine, vaccine or don't show up and expect to be able to get in the line when there are already lots of people pre-scheduled for appointments. Uh, our team is working diligently to prepare for more vaccine if and when it comes. We can vaccinate more than the 7,000 or 12,000 people a week that we are currently vaccinating. However, and I want everybody to understand this, the state is currently receiving about 72,000 doses per week. And they've told us that this is what they expect probably for the next three or four weeks. That's 72,000 doses for the entire state. Out of that, our health department, the, the health departments in the state receive about half of that. And then out of that half, we get our, our allocation. So there are very few vaccines out there. Um, the state doesn't have have the ability to give us more vaccine because they themselves aren't getting more vaccine. So it's a very limited supply um, and we are moving through it as quickly as we can. Like I said, we're vaccinating everybody that we get doses for every week. Um, this week, uh, we got our new allotment of vaccine, this time for first and second doses. Um, I will point out that in other weeks, we told you that we were always being told on the weekend what we were going to get on Tuesday. This, this week, the state told us on Monday what we were going to get on Tuesday. Just to give you an idea of how hard it is to plan and schedule things when you don't know what you're going to get until the day before you get them. Um, we received 11,900 doses, 7,300 were first doses. These would be new people and 4,600 were for folks um, who already received their first dose and they are four weeks past that date of getting the first dose, they're getting their second dose now. So far, our local health departments received a total of 27,000 first doses of vaccine that we've been able to administer pretty quickly. We need a larger allocation from the state to match our population. We are, vac we are pre registering so that once we have the vaccine to begin vaccinating people in 1B, we can set up the appointments. And we were sending out weekly alerts to people who have signed up to let them know where we are. Over 75,000 people have signed up for alerts. We're creating a call center with 30 call center responders to assist residents with questions and registration. We need to continue um, people to continue to get tested. Um, that is important. We still have to control the, control the spread of the virus um, until we are largely vaccinated. And since that's gonna be a while, um, we need for people to continue to get tested and we need for people to continue to wear their masks. I want to point out this so people can put our doses in context. If I get 7,300 new doses a week and I have a senior population of 75,000 people, if that number of new doses doesn't change, 
That's a 10 week long line. On top of that, the governor moved teachers into group into this group. And on Monday, I believe he's adding in 90 or 100,000 people who are between the ages of 65 and 74. So he's going to create a group that thinks they're immediately eligible for vaccine. They are eligible. But he's not increasing the amount of vaccine beyond 7,000 new doses. So I can move you up in a line. I can put you in a line you weren't in before. But it doesn't mean you're going to get vaccinated any faster unless the number of vaccines that we get actually increases. So in Maryland, there are about 1.8 million Marylanders all told in phases 1A, 1B, and 1C. Approximately 300,000 of them have been vaccinated. So that leaves 1.5 million people to share 72,000 vaccines a week. Um, it's going to be a while. There are reasons to be hopeful. There are new companies that will likely get approval within the next month or so, at least two, we're hoping. That will increase the supply. The two people who are supplying Pfizer and Moderna have announced efforts to ramp up their production. And if they ramp up production, that should help us somewhat. But remember, they're doing this for the whole country, not necessarily just for Montgomery County. And you know, finally, the um, new president has said they may use the War Powers Act basically to require companies that have the capacity to produce vaccine to produce the vaccines that are being produced by the companies that have the vaccine or have the patents. Everybody will get paid, no doubt, but it'll bring more machinery online to increase the number of doses that are available. All that's going to take weeks to happen. So we just keep trying to remind people, be patient. It's not going to change immediately. We're on the road to vaccines. We are vaccinating people, but we still need more supply. But there is hope that we will see that supply at some point in the not horribly distant future. I don't know what the right adjective in front of that is right now, but uh, it will be coming, um, just not right now. And I'll turn this over to Dr. Gales. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Thursday. As always, a pleasure to be with you. Before I go into remarks uh, related to vaccination and cases, I would like to report that I did receive my second dose of the Moderna vaccine on yesterday. And separate from a little bit of a sore arm uh, this morning, uh, I feel entirely fine and have not experienced any side effects to date. And this is about 28 hours um, after the administration of the dose. So we will continue to keep you posted and be transparent about the rest of that experience. Now to pivot into the information that the county executive covered and a couple other things I'd like to highlight before taking questions. We continue to see the case numbers stabilize to some degree. The numbers have come down some on a state level as well as a local level. We're not seeing cases in the 3000s and cases on a local level in the 500s or 600s in the last few days. Now, we're continuing to watch that and certainly monitoring our hospital utilization as the county executive referenced. We're seeing about 80% capacity both in acute bed usage as well as ICU coverage. And in listening to the state uh, surveillance call this morning, we anticipate there's probably about 34 to 35% of uh, folks who are hospitalized are, are COVID patients. And that number has come down some in the last week or so. We continue to monitor to see if we have any evidence of any of the new variant strains of COVID. So far, I think as of earlier this week, there have been three reports of the UK variant in uh, Maryland cases so far. We've not received any notification that we have any of those cases in Montgomery County. The state is bolstering and beefing up its surveillance capacity to be able to monitor for the presence of any of those variants. We continue to test at an impressive clip and to, to shift into the area that I know most people are talking about these days in terms of vaccinations. So the first point with vaccinations is, as the county executive very wonderfully articulated, is that there are issues with doses and availability of doses. Now, in our vaccine week, we typically, as he referenced, find out what our allocation is over the weekend. This weekend, we found out on Monday afternoon, and we typically get those doses sometime Tuesday afternoon or early evening, and they're put into circulation starting Wednesday. So from a Wednesday to Tuesday uh, clip, this past week, we had vaccinated, utilized 99.6% of the doses we had received in Montgomery County. 
99.6% of those doses that the health department had received. I want to stick that out there and emphasize that. So as we get them, we are putting them out there, but we have a long way to go in terms of achieving all of the individuals who meet the criteria based upon the eligibility criteria that has been set forth. Now, some have said, well, why do we have a prioritization framework in place? The key reason is because in, the, in, a, in an environment where there's a shortage of supply, you have to create some type of system that is fair and equitable to provide the benefit to those who are at potential risk, greater risk of exposure. And we, along with a number of other jurisdictions across the state of Maryland, have put up frameworks and share those frameworks publicly so that folks understand the order within which we are looking at our criteria. Now, some at the state level have said, well, we're, we've moved to 1B and why, some places are doing it, why aren't we doing it here? We've been very transparent about the math. As the county executive mentioned, we've got 50 to 60,000 individuals who qualify for 1A status. This morning, we had received 26,000 doses at the local health department. So do the math. Now, we recognize those challenges and we have moved forward and we have been providing vaccines for individuals in the 1A category, the tiers one, two, and three. And we are hopeful that we will be able to move forward and begin offering vaccine to those over the age of 75, potentially as early as early next week. Now, we have been very transparent and very clear about how that process moves forward. We have created multiple sites, including the pre-registration so individuals who will be eventually meeting that criteria can pre-register so that we have your information so that we can send you a link to register in the system and schedule your appointment. It's become apparent to us in the last week or so that those links are being shared inappropriately and individuals are getting access to links that aren't sent from the county apparatus and are scheduling appointments even though they don't meet the criteria that we have clearly laid out in terms of the prioritization uh, matrix and algorithm that has been publicly available for multiple weeks now and readily accessible on our public website. In addition to that, the public website very clearly lays out where we are in terms of how we're moving forward through those different groups. Now, we've been made aware that there was an incident, and we've seen some of the questions in the chat, and I'm sure some of you will ask about it today. We were made aware of an incident today at one of our test sites, where we had a number of folks um, who were over the age of 75 show up who had scheduled appointments. Now, the way the system should work is we are working to create a fair, equitable system that allows for access for all of our residents to be able to utilize the vaccine system when it is their time and in a system that is not based upon who you know or who you may have access to in terms of getting a link, but making sure that we have a process that is fair and accessible for everybody in the county. And we're working hard to do that. Hence, we created a prioritization scheme and we will be releasing information how we will allot doses as we move forward, opening up more to the general public outside of just healthcare workers. And so I want folks at home to understand is that's why we have a process in place and that's why we're honoring the process that we have in place. And we want folks to follow the system we've implemented because again, this is a fair equitable system for everybody in the county. And we wanna make sure that we're clear about supporting that and that there is no, no any close appearance that there is any subjectivity in terms of folks being able to move forward ahead of the time within which they are, um, they meet the criteria for moving forward. So I just wanna emphasize that and just make it very plain and clear that we do recognize that some folks were simply doing what they thought was appropriate because someone sent them a link. But I will say this very clearly to anyone else who is unscrupulously utilizing the links or trying to register ahead of time, we will have zero tolerance for that behavior. I take my job as the health, count, health officer for the county of 1.1 million people to represent everybody within that and to make sure that everyone has fair, equitable access to the systems that we're moving forward and putting into place. So I'm sure you will have other questions, but I wanted to proactively address that and let everyone at home know that we are working hard to make sure that we have a system that is fair for everybody to access. And let's not forget, the reason why we are in this situation, as the county executive clearly articulated, is because we have a shortage of vaccines. If we had an infinite supply or an increased supply, 
we would be able to move forward at a faster, quicker pace. We've clearly demonstrated that our county apparatus has been effective in rolling vaccines out when we receive them. And so to anyone at the state level or anywhere far and few in between who has questions or concerns about where we stand in terms of our priority groups, send us more doses. We'd be happy to get them out and we'd be happy to move forward and get more folks vaccinated. Thank you. All righty, thank you, Dr. Gales. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> County Executive. And with that, we're gonna open it for the um, questions and answer po portion of this briefing. And let's get started with you, Chris Gordon from NBC4. Thank you very much. Um, you know, President Biden has said his goal is to distribute or, uh, 100,000 vaccines in the first 100 days. So I have a, a kind of two questions here. Number one, what would have to happen for that to have an impact in Montgomery County, the pledge of 100,000 doses in 100 days? And number <clears> two, <throat> Baltimore appears to be lifting its uh, restrictions restriction on indoor and outdoor dining tomorrow. Any thoughts on lifting restaurant restrictions in Montgomery County? And this is to all three of you. Okay. I'll tackle the first one and I'll <laughs> defer to Dr. Stoddard, the kind of executive for the reopening piece, because I know we, we've discussed this and talked about this. Um, I actually think you under underestimated the, uh, the, uh, the promise from the Biden administration. I think it's 100 million doses yes. in the first 100 days. Yes, so um, 100,000 wouldn't get us very, very far. So 100, 100 million doses within the first 100 days. I think that is based upon increased production of the vaccines. Uh, it also, they have made some key personnel decisions to put individuals in charge of that process to help standardize the approach in terms of distribution from the federal level to the state levels. Um, that was not present in the past administration. And as we found out this morning, it's the news suggests that there was no actual COVID dis vaccine distribution plan in place. So by increasing productivity, having a standardized plan and having key personnel in places to help drive that process and work closely with states, the hope is that the, 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 the doses released to the states will increase thereby increasing the state's ability as a county executive reference, their ability to provide doses to health departments, as well as other venues such as private practice offices, retail pharmacy spaces, and other places to increase the points of contact within which individuals within our community can access the vaccine. So I'll just uh, tackle the restaurant issue real quickly. Um, if, if we were back in the spring and the summer and had these numbers that we have today in terms of positivity and in terms of cases in per 100,000, virtually nothing would be open. So while we have fallen from, I guess, peaks of 47 cases per 100,000, we're now maybe at 37 cases per 100,000, we are not where we need to be. And I get this all the time, and I'm getting it again now. People are looking at us compared to the rest of the counties in the state. And it's like, oh, you're doing really well. You should reopen. It's like the only word, reason we're doing really well is because we did not reopen. And so we are looking at what the metrics should be for reopening. Um, we're clearly not, you know, I'll say, say this again. I said it months ago. We're not looking to get to zero before we reopen, but we are not going to reopen when our cases are where they are, you know, over 30 per 100,000 and our positivity is over six. Um, we, you know, the doctors can opine on what numbers would look good or reasonable for uh, positivity in cases per 100,000. I'm not going to throw a number out there because that's not my profession. But um, we, we are taking this seriously and we're looking at what we can do. And I will say that, um, in Baltimore, when they did reopen, uh, I had talked to Brandon Scott, uh, the new mayor there, and I had suggested, which was a suggestion, frankly, that came to me from one of the restaurant owners here, that we limit the amount of time that, that a um, patron can be in a restaurant. And so when uh, Brandon reopened the restaurants in Baltimore, they put a limit on how long a patron can sit in a restaurant because they said that, and this was coming from restaurant owner, that patrons, because this is the only place where you can gather and socialize, patrons were sitting far beyond the length of their meal, so they continue to gather and socialize. So that may be one thing that we introduce. In fact, something I want to introduce when we do decide to reopen is to limit the amount of time 
that a person can sit during a meal. Um, but we'll get there, provided everybody wears masks. I mean, I'll say this is a self-inflicted wound. If people hadn't traveled and if people were wearing masks, people wouldn't be getting infected. You know, the virus doesn't spontaneously generate and suddenly spring into the community. It only gets there because it's transmitted. And so we've been urging people not to travel over the holiday. That's not what happened, apparently. We've been telling people to stick with the mandates on keeping masks off. Um, some people may be doing that. Other people may be having parties and social gatherings where that's not so much the case. Um, if everybody wants to see a return to normal and you don't want to wait just for the vaccines to do their job, we have the ability to limit everybody's exposure to this and bring our cases down. And so if we would all just be patient and keep doing what we were doing so well back in the summer, we can get our cases down and we can do some more normal things, which all of us, myself very much included, would like to do. Next question from uh, Jordan Lindsay, my MC Media, and she has questions for you, Dr. Gales, and also for Dr. Stoddard. Thank you so much. Um, Chris Gordon kind of asked the question, and uh, Dr. Gales already touched on it, but I wanted to add something. Um, this goal of distributing 100 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines, this executive order from uh, President Biden, I wanted to know, I might be too early, but do you guys have an understanding of how many of those doses might be coming to the state of Maryland and then, of course, to the county? And then also, um, Biden signed an executive order yesterday, um, including one that requires Americans to wear a mask when in public for the next 100 days and adhere to physical distancing as well. Um, and I wanted to see if anybody had to comment around about that. About time. <laughs> yeah, I think if we did, if we did a simple extrapolation for what we've seen already. So there's been about, I think about 30 million doses distributed across the country, <clears throat> or not, not even quite that much. Maryland's got about 300,000. So if we, we take, you know, three or four times that across the country produced, um, we would expect three or four times what Maryland's received so far, which is probably in the, it's probably a couple million doses by that 100 day part. Uh, or not, you know, it's, it's probably enough to cover maybe 35 to 40 percent of the population in the state of Maryland, if, if the math works out that way. Um, it's hard to, it's, uh, that's just an extrapolation. We have no reason to know. We've not been given, given any indication via the state or the federal government what that increased allocation might look like. And again, I don't think it's going to be a linear increase. You know, I don't think tomorrow that we're going to be starting to see more vaccine. It's going to take probably a month to get vaccine out to get vaccine production ramped up in other places and then you know distribute it out to the states. So I would guess that it's not a linear 100 day increase. It's probably not much of an increase for the next three to four weeks and then a much bigger increase in two months. Dr. Gales, Jordan. I think one of the other things that we um, will help with that that number the number of doses that are available is the fact that we do have two new potential candidates that could potentially be approved for usage within the next month uh, including uh, uh, one from AstraZeneca as well as a candidate from Johnson and Johnson and the one from Johnson and Johnson would be a one dose uh, vaccine and so we're still awaiting more information as they go through their phase three clinical trials uh, um, to give us some indication of their level of protection and effectiveness uh, that will guide that emergency use authorization process and then ultimately determine how quickly they would be made available, um, you know, as a part of that 100 million doses and be made available to the, the local health departments in the states. Thank you. Rebecca Tan with the Washington Post questions for Dr. Gales and also for you, Dr. Stoddard. Rebecca? Thank you. I have two different sets of questions both about vaccines. The first one, I'm wondering if you can clarify again how exactly seniors or members of the public who are not eligible for the vaccine actually got the link to register uh, in recent days. Um, and if you can say, you know, how many seniors or how many people actually turned up and had to be turned away and where, where exactly they were turned away. And then I have another set of questions, but thank you. So we're investigating to find out exactly what happened in this situation. Um, as you know, in the previous weeks, there's been a number of instances where there have been some issues with links being shared inappropriately. And it is unacceptable behavior. If you are a, a person who does meet the criteria and do receive the link, we ask you not to share it with others. 
because the, the issue is we're not trying to prevent people from getting it. We're trying to, again, follow a fair, equitable process that has been put forward based upon the CDC and the ACIB guidelines to determine who fits into which categories based upon scientific evidence of their potential risk of exposure by virtue of the type of work that they do and the type of things that they do and the type of folks that they encounter. And so by sharing it with individuals who don't fit that criteria, that takes appointments from those who do and further delays our ability to move quickly through the process to be able to get to the general public based upon age and other criteria. So we're doing an investigation to try to figure out where this happened and how it happened. We'll be very clear, it was not only just based upon age, we had um, employees in different types of fields show up as well, expecting to get vaccinated when it's very clearly laid out on our website and it's part of the prioritization framework that it was not their time to do so. And just to be clear, so the link, I mean, anyone can fill it out. Basically, if you get your hands on this link, you can fill it out. Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah, the this, this is the, this is the state's prep mod system. This is not a county uh, county link. We have to be, every every dose has to be registered through the state system. The prep mod system is not designed for a low vaccine quantity, high demand situation. It's much more designed for normal flu vaccine, where we have more vaccine than we have people. So there's no need to filter out who's eligible and who's not. We are using a pre-registration process to try and give sort of a two-factor authentication so that you're only getting the link if, if you've been selected. But what's happening is people, healthcare providers most likely, believe they're helping the community by sharing the link that's been provided to them to those others who may be eligible or not eligible. They may be sharing it on a listserv. They're actually doing a great disservice to their community by, doing, by sharing that link by slowing down the process, as Dr. Yale said. But really, this is a this is a failing of the state's prep mod system to properly screen individuals, whether they meet our hearing or not. Uh, they they can register through prep mod, and there's no way to screen them out utilizing that tool without just going by hand through them, which we will have to do in the future because this has happened uh, to screen out and try and make notifications to people that they should not show up for appointments that they made in you know, many cases good faith, but they, you know, obviously if you do not receive a link from the county to register, you should assume that you're jumping on. Got it. And, so, sorry. Rebecca, I want to add to that. This is one of the frustrations with planning with the state. I mean, one example is if we had known all along they only had 72,000 doses, how many weeks of, you know, all of your questions, you know, would have been avoided where we're trying to say we, we need more doses, we don't know what the state's doing. Well, if the state had just said we had 72,000 doses, it would have been as clear then as it is now that you can only do so much with 72,000 doses. What they did with the rollout, the governor did with the rollout of 1D and the seniors, he, he announces it when he does. He obviously knew he was going to do that. None of our jurisdictions got advance notice. We were planning for seniors based on when we get finished with one with with group 1a that would have taken another couple of weeks from the time he announced it and then we would have had the pre-registration up but we got no notice and he announces that group 1b the seniors is now el now eligible with no ability for us to adjust our systems to deal with it using a state system that doesn't take into account where we were in terms of vaccinating people in group 1a which was the governor's original priority. So we weren't able, we're not able to plan with them. And I, you know, Dr. Gales didn't mention this, but I think the first phone number that they that they put on the website was his desk phone. Like you're like telling people to call this number. That's not very helpful, you know, and then directing them to our website to get registered when we weren't even doing that. So this is where sitting down a few days in advance, letting us know what do they want to do, asking us what are we prepared to do, what do, what do our systems look like right now, so we could have planned an orderly rollout of this. That's all we're asking for. I'm not asking them to manufacture vaccines. We just want his departments to work with us so that we're all coordinated with each other. And that's what we're not right now. Got it. And one more important question, I think, 
on, on the minds of a lot of people, Dr. Gales. You've said before that the strategy is to start vaccinating 1B while you continue to vaccinate 1A, this you know, airline boarding system. Um, so I think the question that a lot of people have is why not start doing that now? There are still people in 1A, but why not start vaccinating people in 1B as you finish up with 1A? Well, Rebecca, that is an excellent question, but I think we've been very clear that we have thousands of people that still have to move through the queue. And we've been very honest and open to say that we weren't going to wait for everyone to get the vaccine, but we also want to see a significant portion to make sure they've at least had a first go and access to it. And so in this past week, we've opened up the vaccination to many of those folks who are in the 1A tier three category to allow them an opportunity to register for appointments before we move forward. And we've also been very clear that we are hopeful that within the next week, we would be able to move forward in terms of um, providing vaccines or starting to provide vaccines to those over the age of 75. But let me emphasize again, and if I seem frustrated by this, know that my true frustration is 10 times what you're seeing right now. The system is not fit to do what we need to do. We have thousands of people, as Dr. Stoddard mentioned, we have over 70,000 people who I think are over the age of 75 in Montgomery County. And when you add those who are over 65, that's 170 to 180,000 people. And I'm getting 7,000 uh, 7, doses a week to dole out. The math doesn't add up. And so part of what I hope is the story here, and I hope folks at home understand is, we are working hard to get you doses. Trust me, we don't wanna turn anybody away. We wanna get everybody covered right away to get you protected. But we're working with limited resources and we're doing everything that we can to utilize all of the different strategies we can to cover people, again, in a fair, equitable way so that everyone in the county has fair, equal access to the system and that system is supported. And so, yes, we will continue to move forward as quickly as we can. Hopefully, we will get an increase in doses. And yes, we're not going to wait for everyone to get the vaccines before we move to the other group. There just has to be some understanding and respect for the math and the fact that we've got multiple thousands of people who fit into these categories while we're only getting minimal thousands of doses to provide to that group on a weekly basis. Thank you. Okay, next, Bob Barnard from Fox 5 DC has a follow-up for you, Dr. Gales. Bob? Hey, Dr. Gales. I, I sense your frustration, and I get it. So I think you have answered the question, but we were out at Quince Orchard, and we had, you know, one senior after another coming up to us, showing us their paperwork. I've got an appointment. I've got an appointment. Why would they let me in? There's nobody here, and they say we can't go in. So what you're saying is that even though the state says people 75 and older are now eligible, in the county system, they are not yet, and somehow they've made these appointments incorrectly? So what we're saying is the first thing is, um, thank you for covering the event. Um, we were made aware that there are a number of press folks there, but also let's be very clear. I think that we had an instance yesterday, someone filed a complaint and brought it to our attention and threatened to bring the press in to force us to move and provide access to the vaccine to those folks. And let me say, that's just not a fair way approach to going about doing business and help and having a fair discourse and exchange of ideas. And so again, we as a, I as a health officer and overseeing the public health team, we won't tolerate threats and those types of behavior to try to move people through the system that runs counter to how it's been laid out. Again, our commitment is to providing a fair, equitable system for folks to access. Now, as it relates to the situation today, again, we the state had made a determination as County Executive Elridge laid out. The governor said the state is moving forward in this direction. We've been very clear when we announced the prioritization model several weeks ago that we recognize that we probably would lag behind the state because we have thousands of people in these categories that doesn't that need coverage and we're not getting the adequate supply of vaccine to cover them at the same time period that some of the smaller jurisdictions have. You know, some of the, the smaller jurisdictions have a smaller population and they've been able to move through their groups. And we certainly support them being able to move forward to provide the vaccines to their residents at the pace that they need to do so, recognizing their needs. But we're in a different situation. And so the challenge here is, and again, to anyone at the state who questions, well, why haven't we jumped to 1B? We're trying to move through as quickly as we can with the resources that we have. And again, it's well documented that we've been successful at rolling out the vaccines we've received. So again, as yesterday, 
yesterday, we had rolled out 99.6% of those vaccines. We received 7,300 this week. Yesterday, we did just shy of 2,000 vaccinations across the three different sites that we had. So we continue to move at a pace that will exhaust the, the allotment that we have most likely by next Tuesday afternoon. And so we are concerned that individuals, again, as, as Dr. Stoddard pointed out, there's some folks who by no fault of their own registered thinking that they were available. We know that some others may have known, know, known that they were not eligible but still registered. They received a link from other sources that were not from the county site. And so they schedule their appointments that way. And the concern that we had when it was brought to our attention was that this would create the appearance of subjectivity and it would allow individuals access to the system when it was not their time and that would not be fair and appropriate to everyone else who is waiting for their time in the queue. And so that's why we took the action that we did. I'm sorry and unfor it's unfortunate that it got to the point where press was brought in to have this discussion. But again, we stand by our principles in terms of creating a system that's fair and equitable to everybody to access. And as has been pointed out by the county executive and Dr. Stoddard, we will be releasing that information utilizing our multiple venues through the pre-registration system to notify those folks when it's time for them to schedule their appointments and to move through the queue. All right, and you don't know when that is yet? No, we don't. We hope we are hopeful that we will be able to move forward with the 75 and up age group, which for us represents tier, uh, group 1B tier 1 and give them prioritization within the next week. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Gales. Thank you, Warren. Marilyn Matters has a question also about allotments. Vicki? Yeah, this, this is a follow up um, with the whole math issue and the allotments. So county officials have been saying we're not getting our fair share in Montgomery County. I hear Dr. Gale saying we're not getting enough. So earlier this week, I asked the governor's office how they made the allotments and they said it was by percentage of population, which if you do the percentage of population and the doses, it doesn't add up. So as a follow up, um, I ask again, and they told me that in Montgomery County, they included all three hospitals, Suburban, Shady Grove, and Holy Cross, and they included the doses for NIH. So that's being factored in as part of our population. Is this something that we've been aware of? Um, is, is it, how are we pulling those in? Do you know what I'm saying? If, if it's all together in Montgomery County, how are you coordinating that? That's an excellent question, and uh, I would actually reference uh, from another article. I don't know if we have someone from the seven state. I don't know if it's yeah, I read, from I read that. okay. Yeah, that actually just, broke down the, yeah. this morning. Had a, an interesting layout in terms of the number of doses and rates. So let me let me start by saying, you know, I don't envy my colleagues at MDH who have to make these decisions because, as a county executive reference, they are having to thread lots of needles based upon a limited supply coming from the federal government. And so their task is having to figure out how do I get to hospitals, nursing homes, long-term care facilities, to local health departments. And so they have a tough task as well. But unfortunately, what, what that translates to is it puts the local jurisdictions in a tough position to use a limited supply to dole out. And so several weeks ago, we actually had initiated conversations with our hospital health systems to talk about how we could leverage the resources they have um, from the perspective of clinical space, clinical expertise, as well as potentially tapping into their doses that they have that their staff members may not have, have utilized. And in fact, we've been able to um, have a series of meetings, they're still ongoing, but I know at least two of the hospitals will be standing up clinics starting next week where community folks who do fit the 1A category, and I believe once we start 1B, excuse me, will be able to schedule appointments at their sites to come in and take advantage of the doses that they have. So we've been coordinating and working with them to create a structure that thereby increases the supply that we have. And we've been working to create lists of folks to be able to send to, uh, to them so that they can utilize. Yeah. But also, I would also oh, add, sorry, okay. it was, it was I, I mean, NIH was sort of, I don't know if it was news to Dr. Gales when you said that, but we've had, we've been having NIH employees come into our, our, our health, who are healthcare providers come into our uh, 1A categorizations as well. And so, you know, obviously this speaks to the lack of communication from what the state's providing us in terms of information because 
you know, we certainly didn't, you know, we, we wouldn't have be, we wouldn't be putting these people through our community clinics or our, our county clinics if we knew that they were being covered by their employer, which they don't know that. We don't know that. Um, apparently the state is claiming that they know that, but so it just, it just reflects the fact where, um, you know, we've been told the state is going to take more of the doses that are supposed to go to the local health departments and put them out through the more pharmacy partnerships that are going to be, you know, announced over the coming weeks. And, um, you know, those will come out of doses that will go typically to the health departments. And so we're sort of hearing these things um, indirectly through members of our delegation who are asking the Department of Health. Um, you know, we find out what the governor says when he says it. We have, he has a press conference about schools at 2.30 today. We have no idea what's going to be said at that. Um, so, I mean, it's just, we're finding out a, in real time and having to react to what is announced and scrambling to try and serve our residents. And it just, you know, I, you know, we respect the authority of the governor to make decisions, but obviously him communicating those decisions in a timely manner so we can be prepared to execute on those decisions would be helpful to his constituents and ours. Yeah. Can I just um, add one thing? Um, are you aware that Suburban has already set up sort of a pre-registration for um, the public? It's called My Chart, so that people who, who have been patients um, at Hopkins facilities can, can already register, even one B people. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, all the hospitals are working through individual, I believe. Um, uh, I know the, the my chart is actually all of, all, all of uh, Hopkins util, utilizes that system. Um, we, you know, we're, we're in the process of receiving information about how the other hospitals are going to be doing clinics. And in fact, one of the, one of the hospital clinics uh, at Holy Cross, we're actually working with them on including like potentially providing IT support to getting it stood up and some some furniture and other things like that to get the site set up. So we're working pretty very closely with the hospitals. Um, that's been a direct, you know, us and, and the hospitals relationship. And you know, we should have more to say about that. Some have already, some already. I think like Holy Cross took some appointments this week, and we'll take more moving forward. I know the Adventist system is, has a has a has a, a clinic with MedKai to do more of the tier one uh, A uh, or group one A tier three folks to get them through. And so. The hospitals are really coming and ramping up. They've received the message from the governor that if they have more than 75% of their vaccine or haven't distributed more than 75% of their vaccine, uh, they won't be receiving more doses. And so we're really pushing to help them get through that finish line and, and get more doses. Thank you. Brianna Arikusuma from Bethesda Beat has a question for Dr. Gales. Brianna. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask a quick clarification question. Uh, Dr. Gales, you told the council on Tuesday that the county is requesting the maximum number of doses that it can each week. Um, and Dr. Bridger said last week that uh, there was no limit to the request. So can you clarify what the maximum amount is that you can request? And are you requesting that each week? And are, are you making those requests each week on Tuesdays? Just can you give that general timeline of, because I know you, you mm -hmm. all aren't finding out until the weekends or in this past case, Monday. Sure. So we, when I say we're requesting the maximum, we're basically saying send us as many doses as you can. <laughs> we'll take them. Uh, and so there is no magical maximum number, but again, as the county executive referenced in his opening remarks, the state is working with a pretty static 70, somewhere between 72 to 74,000 doses on a weekly basis. And so within that, we have requested, I know uh, each week we've requested up to 20,000 doses. Now, certainly the state, we recognize the state working with a finite number, you know, requesting 50,000, we're not going to get 50,000, it's 70 because they've got 72,000 doses. But we've been, we've been requesting um, the state to send more um, because we, you know, have the capacity to absorb. And I do know that they are working very hard to take that into consideration. And when I say the we, the team that at MDH who's working on the vaccines, who communicates with all of the vaccine coordinators on a regular basis. And the way the process happens is each week, our vaccine coordinator will send in a request to the state and say, hey, here's what we think, here's the capacity we think we can handle based upon the infrastructure that we have in place. And so multiple weeks, we've requested upwards of 20,000, um, recognizing that it's coming out of that small pool. But you know, we'd love to be able to get as many as we can. And so when I reference and say we're asking for the maximum, again, we're saying send us as many as you possibly can, recognizing that there's a lot of hands that I have to, to, to pull from the pot of that fixed dose, the amount of doses. And what, which day of the week are those requests usually made to the state? 
Uh, usually they're sent in Wednesdays and Thursdays. Um, so again, the state you typically finds out their allotment of doses on Tuesdays or Wednesdays. And once they find out how many doses are available, they communicate and contact with the local vaccine coordinators to then ask them to send a, a weekly ask. Um, part of that is also influenced. Um, all of the vaccines that are administered are uh, chronicled in the electronic system. And so even though there have been some issues with the prep mod system, uh, in terms of registration, it has been effective in terms of pulling information to track who is getting vaccinated. And all of the vaccines have to be registered in the Immunet system. And by doing so, that's where the state pulls the reports and is able to say, you know, Montgomery County has distributed, you know, 90% of their doses according to a particular date. And so once the, the state gets the information, they send that request out to the coordinators, and then the coordinators in turn send in the request. Um, and from my understanding, the factors that go into determining how many doses folks get is influenced by the past utilization trends um, and successes of those respective jurisdictions. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Gales. Any other questions from the members of the media? Going once, going twice. There is a question on, oh, Rebecca Tan has a follow-up. Rebecca? So, sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to check, my, you, uh, I, is anyone able to say, you know, roughly how many people may have been turned away yesterday uh, because of this, you know, link being spread around? I don't know the exact number, but we did work to go through and look at the schedule to make sure um, that individuals who did meet the criteria were appropriately notified to prevent them, you know, from coming out, you know, because it is cold outside. Um, and so we wanted to try to minimize um, folks coming into the base and having to be turned around and to cancel those appointments and explain to those individuals why that action was taken. And I can say anecdotally from the feedback that I received from staff is that a significant percentage of individuals who were notified were understandable and understood that it wasn't necessarily their time to do so. And they were okay with their appointment being canceled and, and ultimately uh, needing to come back in and have it rescheduled in the future. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Vicki Warren has another follow-up question, and then we'll, we'll get to a question that was posted on the chat. Vicki? Now, I guess my, my follow-up is, so right now, if the way things are going in the counties is the system is very uneven. Some people are into 1B. Cecil County is already doing teachers. So there is no um, sort of systematized progression. So is that something that is okay? Um, I guess this is a question for Mark, um, you're a county executive. So we're sort of out of, out of, um, a little bit out of whack and we'll continue to be that way. And so I guess the reason I think about it is a lot of Montgomery people made appointments in PG County um, and they got appointments and now PG County is cutting people off, but they're gonna do all the Montgomery County people through February 9th. So that's the system we're in. Yeah, this goes back to what I said before, you know, a few days of planning could have avoided all of this. I mean, I, you know, I suspect that, you know, the Prince George's County system was no, it's the state system is the state system. So you could plug yourself in over there and get appointments. I mean, I'm sure that there are people who are concerned that the vaccines that are calculated for Prince George's County based on the population of Prince George's County going to people from other counties is not what anybody ever intended. Just like our vaccines are calculated on, you know, our proportion of the population. So even if, it, you know, I partly feel that even if you knew it was available in Prince George's County, you shouldn't have taken it. Because you should, you know, people should have just understood the fundamental kind of justice that's involved in making sure that everybody gets what they're supposed to get. Um, we will clean up, up what we need to clean up, including having to monitor, now we will have to monitor who is signed up to make sure that people haven't, you know, jumped the queue. This will be a little bit different next week when we start taking reservations. So people who get in will, you know, be able to register themselves as 75 year olds. Teachers will eventually get allowed. People who are 65 and older, all their times will come. But we're, this puts us in a situation of wasting resources monitoring something that could have been built the right way the first time if the state had taken a few moments 
to breathe and to ask their people, you know, we're about to do this. Could you please set it up so it works the way we need it to work? I would, I would point out too that we had an emergency managers meeting across the state two weeks ago today. So that was the first week of uh, January. And the, the emergency managers in Garrett County County, St. Mary's, and a couple others were saying the governor is holding us back from going to 1B because the allotments they received in the first week covered all of their 1A population. This is not the besmirch. I'm not. This is not a critique of the other counties, but it, but to me, this speaks to a, a pretty poor allocation uh, process, whereby you cover all. You cover more. You give more doses than will cover the entire phase for one county, and you give not enough to cover it over four times the amount of time to another county. And so that to me is why we're in this situation because the allocations are totally uneven. And you know, I'm not asking for us to race ahead of other counties. I think we're just being asked to be kept consistent with other counties by giving us the doses that are appropriate to do so. And that's just not, that's just not, what hap not what's happening now. And so it's gonna get even more confusing next week when the state's gonna move into the 1C category, which you know, if you do the statewide math, the state, the state in their first slides the governor presented says that there are approximately 892,000 in the state of Maryland in phase 1B. We receive 72,000 doses a week. I do not understand how you can do the math that makes it work out such that a 72,000 dose allocation in one week will be sufficient to have us move through 1B into 1C in the same period of time. So the, the math does not add up and it seems to me that we basically just said at the state level, you know what, we're not going to have a queuing system anymore. We're just going to throw 30% of the people against one another and have them compete for spots. That, that to me, is what has, has come out of these announcements. We just don't believe that's a fair and equitable way to do a vaccine distribution, and we're following the order that we've set up, that were set up long before the governor made these announcements. Um, you know, obviously, there's been a disproportionate amount of death in our 75 and older population, so we're going to move to those, those, that group first before we move into our educators and postal workers and agricultural workers and everyone else. Um, there's, a, there's an order that we've had and we're gonna follow that order because we believe that's the fair, equitable, and you know, from a public health perspective, right thing to do. Okay, gentlemen, we have a couple of questions left on the chat. Uh, what is the difference between prior registration and registration and can one C uh, group pre-register it now? Dr. Gales? <laughs> I'll start. Uh, okay. So we're working on a, we're working on a pre-registration that will go will expand into 1B tiers two and three, and a registration that will candidly what will happen is that the current registration, which is for 75 year olds, will be expanded to 65 year olds in the coming um, coming let's say let's say week week to 10 days. This, uh, similarly, there will be a process stood up. It'll likely be the same process, but I won't promise that yet for those with professions that put them into tiers two and three of 1B and 1C. That will come over the coming you know, week to 10 days. So we're working on that right now. Make sure we do the translations, make sure we have the right questions. Obviously there's a bunch of really diverse uh, professions in those, including like childcare workers who will have to collect a license number, uh, teachers, to, we have to collect what school they're affiliated with, uh, postal workers, which postal office are you like ready to ask different questions to each of the different professions. And that's what we're working through right now. But that, that process will be up in plenty of time, as, and as we alluded to, with 73,000, 75 and older uh, residents, we're going to be in tier one of phase 1B for, for a few weeks, at least. Anything else to add, gentlemen? All right, so with that, we're done with this briefing today. Thank you, everybody, for uh, participating, and uh, we'll see you next week. Have a great afternoon. Bye, everybody. Bye. Uh, thank you all.